Welcome to Radiology Case Review, ultrasound of pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland, the most common salivary gland tumor. I'm Dr. Dan Colville from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show two cases of pleomorphic adenoma, highlighting key teaching points throughout. All right, so this first case was a female patient in her mid-40s who presented with a left cheek mass. So here we're scanning with a high-resolution linear transducer. You can see this is a 14 megahertz transducer. And generally, a high-resolution transducer is the best way to evaluate the superficial salivary gland structures like the parotid gland. So here we're looking at the mandible, and then this is at the edge of the parotid gland. And you can see that this mass is arising from the parotid gland because we have a claw of tissue around it. And the mass itself is homogeneously hypoechoic. It has very sharply defined lobulated margins here, and there's posterior acoustic enhancement as evidenced by this brightening posterior to the mass. When we turn the transducer 90 degrees and now we're sagittal, you can again see that lobulated margin that's very well circumscribed with this posterior acoustic enhancement, and we see parotid gland as well around the mass. It's also in the superficial aspect of the gland because we can see that it's just below the skin surface, and it measures about 2.5 centimeters. We want to examine the rest of the parotid gland just to look for any additional masses. We see some normal vessels, but this seems to be a solitary parotid mass. And when we add directional power Doppler flow, we do see that there is some moderate increased vascularity within the mass. Also seen with this microvascular flow imaging, microvascular flow can detect slow flow in small caliber vessels. And this went to surgery yielding pleomorphic adenoma. So pleomorphic adenomas are also known as benign mixed tumors. And there's a lot of most commons here. These are the most common salivary gland tumor, the most common benign salivary gland tumor, and they're most commonly in the parotid gland, as in this case. We see them most common in patients age 40 to 50, slightly more so in female patients. And a good general rule for salivary gland masses in adults, the larger the salivary gland, the more likely the mass is benign. So the parotid gland is the largest of the salivary gland, so most of these tumors, about 80%, will be benign. The submandibular gland, which is smaller, only about 50% will be benign, and the sublingual glands, much more likely to be malignant, only 20% of these are benign. And then along those lines, there's a parotid gland 80% rule. This is an estimate of 80%, but about 80% of all salivary tumors are located in the parotid gland. 80% of benign parotid gland tumors are pleomorphic adenomas. 80% of pleomorphic adenomas occur in the parotid gland, as opposed to other salivary glands like the submandibular gland. 80% of these adenomas will occur in the superficial lobe of the gland as opposed to the deep lobe. And finally, 80% of these, if untreated, will stay benign, but 20% will undergo malignant degeneration. Now, in ultrasound, these tend to be well-defined masses with lobulated borders, hypoechoic with posterior acoustic enhancement, and the homogeneity of internal echoes is common. So the case we just saw is very typical for pleomorphic adenoma. However, when these are larger, they may have cystic degeneration and internal heterogeneity and that can mimic a malignant parotid tumor. The vascularity of the tumor is variable. They can be hypovascular or hypervascular. It's nonspecific. Generally, malignant tumors will tend to have disorganized hypervascular flow, but that is also not always a reliable finding. And because these parotid tumors on ultrasound can have overlapping appearance, part of our role as imagers is to describe lesion location, which can be helpful for image-guided biopsy planning and also evaluate for cervical lymphadenopathy. All right, let's look at the second case. So this was also a patient in her mid-40s, female patient with a left cheek mass, and an ultrasound was done. Again, we're using the linear transducer here, high resolution, and we see that there's a superficial mass within the parotid gland here. It's very heterogeneous and has these lobulated margins. We want to evaluate the entire gland. We can see that it has a claw of parotid tissue around it, indicating that it does arise from the gland. It's within the superficial lobe, and it's overlying the mandible here. That's this echogenic shadowing structure. As we further evaluate the mass, you can see that there is a small lymph node next to it, but it does have normal morphology. It has a normal reniform shape with an intact fatty hilum. The parotid gland is unique from other salivary glands in that it can normally contain lymph nodes. And as we zoom into this mass, you really can appreciate the internal heterogeneity compared to the prior case we saw, which was fairly homogeneous. And that's in part due to the large size of this mass. This one measures about 3.7 centimeters. But Despite that internal heterogeneity, we still maintain this sharp, lobulated contour. It's not ill-defined or spiculated. And here we're starting to see the deep lobe of the parotid gland, which is often not well seen on ultrasound because it passes beneath the mandible here and gets shadowed out. But you can still pick up masses in this region. Here's that deep lobe. Here's the mandible. 
and the deep lobe protrudes between the mandible and part of the mastoid process. Sometimes you can also see the styloid process extending deeply, but masses in this region would be more difficult to characterize. Now, we can further tell that we're in the superficial lobe because although this mass has no internal vascularity with color Doppler imaging, we do see some vascular flow in a curvilinear distribution just posterior to the mass. Here we can see that a bit better using microvascular flow imaging, and that tells us that we are in the superficial lobe, as I'll explain momentarily. Here we're looking at a cine clip showing the mass here just overlying the mandible, extremely heterogeneous and lobular. And again, there's that deep lobe here protruding in between the mastoid process and the mandible. So this is in the superficial lobe. So as we saw with these cases, pleomorphic adenoma tends to arise from the superficial lobe of the parotid gland, which makes them great for ultrasound evaluation. But when they less commonly arise from the deep lobe, they can be more difficult to fully visualize with ultrasound because of obscuration from the mandible. And the superficial and deep lobes are divided by the facial nerve, which actually travels through the parotid gland. The nerve itself is not readily seen, but it does pass just superficial to the adjacent retromandibular vein, which can be seen. And you can use that as a landmark. And also, just inferior to this retromandibular vein, you might see branches of the external carotid artery, which will also appear as flow-containing structures. So the bottom line is if you see a parotid mass anterior to vascular structures, that's another clue that you're dealing with a mass in the superficial lobe. Now, these masses can be biopsied as long as care is taken to avoid the region of the facial nerve. And then ultimately, excision is typically performed because there is a risk of malignant degeneration, particularly into carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, if the mass is not completely excised. And then just to briefly touch upon the differential diagnosis for pleomorphic adenoma in the parotid gland, there are many parotid tumors, but the ones that are most common and to be aware of is Warthin tumor. That's the second most common benign parotid tumor after pleomorphic adenoma. These tend to occur almost exclusively in the parotid gland, and they can also be bilateral in 20%, so that's a helpful differentiating feature. They often also have a cystic component, but they'll maintain a sharp margin. And they're most common in elderly patients, so older patients than what we would typically see with pleomorphic adenoma. And then malignant tumors, many of them in the parotid gland have a similar ultrasound appearance, and that includes ill-defined margins in a regular shape, so different than the well-circumscribed lobulation we've been seeing with these cases. They can have heterogeneous internal architecture, which is nonspecific, but the presence of extra glandular extension and adjacent morphologically abnormal lymphadenopathy, those would definitely raise suspicion for malignant tumors. And in the parotid gland, the most common malignant tumor is the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So that's the most common salivary gland malignancy overall, and it's the most common in parotid gland. The second most common in the parotid gland is adenoid cystic carcinoma. That's actually, though, the most common submandibular and minor salivary gland malignancy. And the differentiating feature for this tumor is it has a higher risk of peridural spread. So remember, the facial nerve passes through the parotid gland, and these patients can present with facial pain or facial nerve paralysis. Typically, pleomorphic adenomas, these patients present with a smooth, enlarging mass that's painless. So anytime you are scanning a patient with a history of facial pain and a parotid mass, that raises your suspicion that this may be a malignant tumor. All right, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you found this educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great free way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Spotify or Apple, or by clicking the subscribe button on YouTube. It would be fabulous if you would consider leaving a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple. I also post interesting teaching files throughout the week that you can find by following us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit or by clicking the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.